Hey, and welcome to another episode of JavaScript Jabber. This week on our panel, we have Dan Shapir. Hey, coming from a warm yet slightly rainy Tel Aviv. We also have AJ O'Neill. Yo, 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 coming at you live from Silicon Power. Okay, I'm Charles Maxwood from Top End Devs, and I am trying not to cough my way through this episode. Uh, we have a special guest this week, and that is Simon Grimm. Simon, you want to introduce yourself, let people know who you are and why you're famous? <laughs> Thanks for that, yeah. Uh, good evening from Germany. Uh, we also have quite nice spring weather. Uh, I'm Simon Grimm. I'm self-employed developer, content creator, influencer, whatever you want to call me. Uh, I run the Ionic Academy. I run galaxies.dev. I do YouTube. I do Twitter. Uh, I basically live the content creator dream right now. Um, and I'm here to talk about something related to JavaScript, I guess. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we're, uh, we're looking forward to talking about some of the cross-platform options that are out there. Um, yeah, you mentioned spring weather. Um, this time last week, I think it was below freezing. Yeah. And today it's supposed to get up to 74 degrees Fahrenheit, which is like 23, 24 degrees. Oh, Celsius, really? So. Nice. Yeah. Just so you so. know, here it's 29 degrees Celsius, 27, 28. That's basically See, summer in Germany. That's hot. So, so yeah, you're not bragging anymore. 74 <laughs> is perfect. So anyway, um, yeah, Simon, you know, we've talked a bit about like Ionic Academy and galaxies.dev. And uh, yeah, you've done some courses on like Flutter and React Native, and you obviously cover Ionic at Ionic Academy. So yeah, yeah I mean, you know, you've got kind of the cross-platform app ecosystem, and you know, you're you've got some expertise there. So um, I'm a little curious where you would start the conversation about this. Like, if somebody came and said, "Hey, I do web development. I want to do some cross-platform app dev." where do we start yeah That's which like... one which one is best <laughs> oh, yeah. Ooh, you I teed that right question. up for him to offend somebody <laughs> i don't know if i said this before but i basically get that question every week since i, I yeah I'm, i got a nice little overview about the different frameworks and technologies and i've used all of them more or less um and everyone's asking that question but i'm i'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you dan like there is no best framework. Uh, they also have a different purpose. Just just like React and Angular and Vue, they all have some some ups and downs. Um, we got some some differences between them. But uh, if, you, if you come from web development right now uh, and you say, "Hey, can I also build native apps?" Then uh, it's probably the best time in 2023 because all the tools, all the frameworks. And of course, also the devices have improved a lot, uh, improved a lot. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I started, uh, I said this before on a, on a different podcast, I started with Titanium Studio or... Oh, uh, the good old like, days. That was, that was at least 10 years ago, I think. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And at that point, cross-platform apps or hybrid apps. Um, by the way, people don't really call them hybrid apps anymore these days, do they? I haven't heard. I, I don't so think so. I think that term went away Only cars. with. Uh, I think that term went away with the gem stack and isomorphic code and 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 other terms like that. You know, they had their their heyday and now they're gone. Yeah, it's, it's probably better. I think yeah. people Some... used to assign something bad and slow to hybrid apps, and I mean that's the case. Ten years ago, the apps were shit. Yeah, but I, I, I actually I actually would like to pull the conversation even further back. You know, I, I jokingly started by asking which one of these uh, cross-platform development frameworks is the best. But but you know, taking it even further back, if I'm out to build, if I want to build a native application, why would I want to use one of these rather than just building it as a straight on native application. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Swift is, is pretty cool and so is Kotlin. I mean, you know, why not just go full native? I mean, in, in a perfect world, we, we would all build just native apps if we just had the time and budget and resources to do so. The problem is that usually most companies don't have a dedicated iOS native developer and a dedicated Android native developer because those are different skills. 
while pretty much every developer these days knows how to do web development, like it's it's almost become a commodity to do web development. So it is usually a question of, of time and money. But at the same time, of course, we got benefits by doing this kind of cross-platform development as you just need to maintain one code base. So for example, if you write a React Native application that usually runs on Android and iOS from one code base. Well, if you do a native iOS and a native Android app, you always need to maintain them. If you get any bugs, you need to fix it on both platforms. You need to submit it again on both platforms. So it's becoming um, just, it comes down to to money. And as you, yeah. I, I mean, I, I would love to do just native development, but if I go 100% on Swift, which I definitely love, so I can I can tell you, I, I basically started as an Objective-C and Swift developer. So uh, I'm really still in love with that. But if you also want to target Android, which I wanted after like two years in my career, then you just have to find a way to make that work. And for me, that way wasn't learning native Android as well and maintaining two code bases. It was going cross-platform back then. So basically well, what you're saying is that web developers are cheaper and more plentiful <laughs> than <laughs> native developers and therefore... Uh, building hybrid application is more cost effective. <laughs> Maybe it is, definitely, it is usually more cost effective. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't well, know about the salaries of native and cross-platform developers, but it, I don't know. One, I don't one other thing have. I want to throw in on this though is that if I am already building an application with either a Node backend or a web component to my not not web component like web components, but a web uh, part of my technology stack is is web then I have somebody that I can more easily repurpose to something like React Native or Ionic or something like that, depending on the technology stack that I already have, as opposed to them learning a completely new way of doing things in Swift or Kotlin. And so yeah. there's that too, right? Where you have this transferability that you get from the one or the other. And, and I think a lot of it really just depends on how the company's organized and what the context that they're working in is and things like that. I think there is an inherent assumption here that's getting a bit to be a bit problematic, which is that everybody has a web application by definition, and then we, you know, being able to repurpose some of that code to native application is like nah. a, a no-brainer. And I kind of contest that. And and by the way, at Wix, which did which does when I was there which did use uh, React Native, and I believe they still do, It even though they were using React Native, the code base was actually distinct from the React mm -hmm. code that was used to drive the, the web applications. And currently, uh, at Next Insurance, where I work, uh, our native applications are also built using React Native. And also, it's a totally separate code base from our web applications some of which are actually implemented in Angular and not in React. Yeah, so this is now getting to the differences between the different cross-platform approaches. You're totally right. If you're using React Native, you're not really reusing your React web application. I mean, you can mm -hmm. reuse some of your business logic, like some kind of hooks you have probably made, some, some API uh, interaction you've outsourced into different uh, modules, and then you can share that code. But you're right, on React Native, there's not the React DOM you're used to from the web. So writing React Native code looks completely different. You have like a view element, a scroll view, a list, and these kind of things that you don't usually have on the web. While if you take a look at Capacitor, which is, it's not super new, but it's kind of unknown. Like you see it represented just in like single digit percentage in the state of JS survey. Um, with Capacitor, you could basically wrap your React application with just that and build a native application. And with Capacitor, the the dream of 100% code sharing across different platforms is actually possible. So um, there is a difference between the tools. Uh, of course, the output from, from a Capacitor app, or if you also put in Ionic in the mix, which is often done, um, is different to what you get with React Native. But then it not only comes down to the cost and the knowledge of your developers, but ultimately also about what your customers actually want or who your customers are. So if you are developing an in-house enterprise app that your 
I don't know, marketing people or salespeople or whatever in-house just want to use, then usually it doesn't really matter if the app loads in one second or in two seconds or uh, if a certain screen doesn't look perfectly native. While if you build a little game or anything consumer facing that should look and work really great, you are putting a lot more effort into getting those details right and making sure the app really feels native. So uh, ultimately, you need to factor that in as well. Like who is going to using your app? Um, what do they expect? Do they expect native performance or could they be just fine with a progressive web app? Probably even like we we haven't even talked about that yet. Yeah, well, progressive web app, you know, iOS is always in the state of getting there. Uh, yeah, it's, it's... <laughs> constantly <laughs> since five years. Uh, yeah, oh, I, 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 I Safari. Gather, yeah, I gather that, that they're starting to approach it, kind of, but from my understanding, it's still not there. Don't get me wrong. I love, you know, the web. The mobile web is the web, whether you're mm -hmm. uh, progressive, uh, progressive web application or not. Um, but that being said, you know, going back to what you were talking about, uh, the two types of applications, whether it's an internal application with a captive audience and, and, uh, and you're not competing for, you know, with other applications in the app store ver and, and, and versus uh, a commercial application, let's say, where it's, it's definitely, uh, you know, it's in your best interest to, to make it as, as shiny and as seamless as possible. Uh, which different platforms would you use in, in each of these scenarios then? You mean like the native platforms or which? Yeah, I'm talking about the, the development platforms that you were talking about before, like React Native with or without Capacitor, like uh, uh, the others that you mentioned, the names escape me. So I, I would put these on a scale and I would add Flutter to the mix as well because it's just too too popular to not mention it here. Um, I will leave out Xamarin because I'm really not in the .NET world and I don't know if anyone from the .NET world is listening here, but uh, I'm sorry, I don't really have any experience about Xamarin or .NET MAUI, what they're currently working on, so sorry about that. But in terms of the others, um, Capacitor, as I said, you could just have a web application, throw in Capacitor, install it, and then you have a native app. That is probably the least native performance and solution as the technology behind Capacitor is basically you're putting a web view element, like a WK web view on iOS and on Android, a web view component into a native app. And in that web view, you display your web application. And that could be Angular, could be React, could be whatever. Um, so ultimately, you are running basically inside a web view, which is always the criticism these kind of apps will get. Um, in the middle, like getting a bit more native <laughs> is React Native. But then again, as I said before, with React Native, you're moving away from the uh, code sharing that you have with Capacitor. Like with Capacitor, you can 100% use just the web code. With React Native, you can only use a fraction of your code you had on the web with React. But the result from React Native is usually somewhat more native or what people would consider a more native application. Now, if you go to the other end of the spectrum, which is, to me, Flutter, um, you get something... Just one that... second. Just one second. Capacitor, how is that spelled? C capacitor. A P oh capacitor. A, like the okay, capacitor. Because there's also a capacitor. And I was okay. All right. Sorry. Go on. Capacitor. Flutter. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> so on the other end of the spectrum is probably Flutter, uh, which if you don't know is using Google's language Dart. Um so it is completely something else. It is not using your web code unless you've built a web app with Dart, but I don't know a lot of people who've done that. Some people do it. Well, they, <laughs> they do, and, and the, the argument is the same as React Native, right? You can use React Native to build your website. You don't have to use React Native to build mobile, and same is true of, of Flutter. Is that if yeah, you? The, the, I, I, I honestly better, don't. But... I, I honestly don't really get that. So I'm following a few Expo <laughs> okay. guys. So with, with React Native, you can <laughs> use Expo, and it's pretty cool. And they are making a lot of advancement to use React Native now on the web again. Like, 
why are we like React Native was made for native and now we're going back? Like, I, I don't really get so that. So we actually had Taj Singh from a few episodes back talking about that. Um, the case he was making for it essentially was that with proper tooling, it's almost as easy to, to, to do or to use as plain old React. So there's a little price to pay in terms of how to work on the web with the added advantage, as you said, that you get much more cross-platform code. So he came to it from the perspective that he's running a small startup and they need to have a web presence and they need to have a mobile presence. And that's just for them the most cost-effective way to go about it because they cannot afford to have too many developers. So that was the case he was making. But to be honest, I've yet to encounter uh, many other companies, if at all, that are pursuing this policy. So, you know, time will tell. Yeah. I've also been on a few sites that I know are using React Native Web, and it's hit or miss. Some of them work fine, and some of them just don't. How does the DOM look if you inspect it? Have you ever done that? I haven't done that. Okay. Let's let's go back a second. Why why would someone want to create a mobile app? My fear is that if you have a good reason to create a mobile app, none of this stuff is going to work well. It's going to be a, a a crappy experience for people that are used to an iPhone app. So why That's would you actually want not true. A mobile app in the first place? <laughs> That's okay, that's well, totally not true. Uh, AJ. Okay, tell, tell me more. Tell me more. So I said would, I, I said it I said it before. I, both Wix and Next, both of which are investing heavily in their native presence because native is a must. Uh, both of them use React Native React uh, on on for for the you know for their native application for the mobile native applications. Yeah, I've I've used apps that I you know because I I I'm always curious what people are using. I've used apps that I know we're using Capacitor. And Ionic, or without Ionic, I've I've used apps that use PhoneGap, and you know just something pasted on the top of it. You know, so Vue.js is one that comes to mind. I have a friend that all of his apps are that way, um, and I've used React Native apps that I know are React Native apps, and Flutter apps that I know are Flutter apps, and yeah, they they all more or less act just like the regular. Yeah, the, apps. the one you, thing... you really can't tell. The one thing that I do have to add in that context is that both Wix and Next also employ native developers. So, mm -hmm. uh, so the people who are working at the React layer are people who are working primarily on the business logic and leverage, you know, either the components that you get with these environments or custom components that are being implemented by native developers. Okay, and that's right. that's one of the missing pieces for me because when I look at these things, what I see is here's how to do generic stuff that you could pretty much already do in the web, but rather than using the geolocation API of the browser, you use the geolocation API of the phone. It's like, okay, what's the point of being native? But if you've got people in-house that are building native code and then you're making that native code available and you've got a UI framework that actually works well and doesn't, you know, do the same thing that web pages do where they just every element's overlapping every element and the subscribe and cookie banners are <laughs> in, in the way of each other. So you can't X out of either one of them, you know, then, then I, I get Well, that. and there are a lot of, there are a lot of libraries too, that incorporate the native code, right? It's not just that you have to have in-house folks, you know, I've, I've done a bit with React Native and they have libraries that will do the translation to the native code without my having to be a Swift or Kotlin developer. I've done some Swift. I haven't done any Kotlin. And so, um, you know, I just pull it in. It does the native thing and I don't have to think about it. Now, if I had to get hyper specialized on that, or if I had to do something that wasn't a common enough case for somebody to have already written that library for a React Native or something, then yeah, I might have to go pick it up and figure it out myself. By but the way, generally, I haven't had to do that. I have so, to say that from my experience, the primary motivations for building uh, native applications have nothing 
to do with building better user interfaces or better user experiences. Absolutely nothing. They might say something like, oh, click here to install our app for a better experience, but that's BS. It's for the tracking. It's for the tracking. It's for the stickiness. It's, uh, it's you know, I liken uh, visiting a website on your mobile phone is like somebody, like a guest in a, at a hotel. Like the the device is the hotel, and it's just a, ke- a guest coming in and leaving just just as easily. Whereas when you install an app, it's like a tenant moving in. It's there. It's much. It's a much more sticky type of a relationship, and that's what most companies want. They want to be a tenant on your phone. They want to be able to reach out and touch you, to track you, to send you messages whenever they want. Uh, and to get money from you, because what's the solution for payment on the mobile web? Stripe? PayPal? Yeah, but it's not built in. It's not as a seamless right. experience mm. as buying okay. something through your mobile native mobile application. Are we still sitting That's at thirty percent of Apple's cuts? Or I heard something about a lawsuit recently with, that was yeah. significantly changing. That I think that it's still thirty percent. It's still thirty percent. Anyway, Simon, I'm I'm curious what your take is on this, right? Because, yeah, a lot of the functionality that we talk about getting on the mobile app, you know, you can get from a PWA, for example. But yeah, you don't get the icon on the home screen, and there are a few other things. What are the uh, advantages I mean, you, get, you see? Yeah, I mean, you get the icon on the home screen with the PWA, but most of the stuff inside the PWA on is Android, using... not so much on iPhone. On it, iPhone, it, it works well, on iPhone. It, it's even easier on the iPhone. You just tap a button. Yeah, you just tap a button. It's a much more manual process. It, let's put it that it way. It is a yeah. manual process. Yeah. 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 You, I mean, I, yeah they, they put the little arrow that says tap here, and then you tap there. It'll say tap here, and it's like add to home screen. And then you tap. I'm you retarded. I can't put it for you. So you have to do it for me. <laughs> yeah the the installation experience of a pwa on ios is horrible and to, to be really? honest none of my non-tech friends knows about it really nobody knows about pwas really well they i, they, I will they also do it have the little arrow and the arrow says tap add to own home screen It's literally two taps it's tap once tap twice but i, I get Susan, I, I've, I've, I've never seen it search that way I, yeah. they, n- very few apps do it these days. I have a couple of yeah. friends that are hardcore PWA advocates. And so their sites will do it, but yeah, I, I wish more sites did it. Twitter, the, the Twitter experience works that way. And it's, it's awesome. Twitter is like, like I said before, I think Twitter is the best web app on a phone in terms of it, it appears native. There's it's, no, yeah, I think it's not called Twitter anymore. I think it's now called Titter. I thought it was called Doger. No, that's all right. I'm gonna, all on Mastodon. I'm going to rewind things for a second here because <laughs> I think one of the other things that gets me, at least for the apps versus, um, you know, having a web experience, especially on iOS, is that I haven't really gotten the push notifications to work well yeah. on a PWA. And push notifications on apps that you're trying to monetize in particular become really important because you are able to you know, as Dan said, you're a tenant on, on the phone now and you can send them a message and say, hey, did you want to be part of this? Hey, did you want to be involved in this? Hey, did you did you remember that we're doing this event or whatever? Yeah, having push notifications is usually a showstopper for most companies. If, if you approach them and say, hey, let's build a PWA and then, oh, but we can't do push notifications, then it's usually a no-no. But um, it looks like Apple is opening up, so... I haven't implemented it yet with Safari, but it looks like uh, web push notifications should now work with Safari as well. However, the whole PWA versus native thing, again, on the PWA, you're using web APIs. And for example, if you use the geolocation, it might work inside a PWA, but you're not getting anywhere close to the performance and the uh, accuracy of using the native Mm -hmm. geolocation plugin. Like, so this would, is a whole different my... level. Like, if you want to track your Uber driver or something, right, you don't right. want to use the web geolocation. Right. I get you. I get you. So, um, on board. this is definitely uh, another big plus for, for going native. And 
um, check. Yeah, there are tons of native plugins. Like if you if you look into the Cordova community, so Cordova came basically before Capacitor. I mean, it's a different mm-hmm. company, and before that, it was PhoneGap. But then right. I think Adobe got it or something. I don't know. Yeah, Adobe exactly got it, and then they turned it over to the uh, was it the uh, Apache, Apache Foundation? Phone. Yeah, right. And the Apache and I think graveyard. that's when the name changed. So yeah. Apache yeah. changed the the name of it, and because PhoneGap was still a proprietary trademark. And yeah. yeah. And so, anyway, and so, there's and so a lot we, of we end there. up with with tons of Cordova plugins, which basically wrap native device functionality, so you can use it with JavaScript. Um, however, tons of these plugins are not outdated, but not maintained because most of them were community created. And mm-hmm. if you look at uh, GitHub repositories and see the last commit is like five years ago, um, you can usually already bet that these plugins won't work with today's iOS or Android versions anyway, because like some kind of problem. So going back to where we started before, if I hire you to develop a native application for me, I've got a small company, I need a native application, I want it to run on Android and iOS, what would you use? I I, I would ask you a few more things like, who's your end user? Do you only want to have a native application or do you also want to have a web application? Um, is some of the pl- is the platform more important? Like probably you just have iOS users. Some people say they have 95% of Android users. Um, what, I mean, I wouldn't ask you what your previous experience is because I would be the, the consultant to <laughs> develop your app. So I would <laughs> use what I think is best. But we would have to really figure out what's the best thing. Like if you want a lot of code sharing, then we would do something with Capacitor. If you want a totally unique native experience, we would either go with Flutter or we would even do it completely native with Swift and Android. If you can, like if you if you say, okay, I'm fine in the future, we're going to have to uh, maintain and update two platforms uh, and two code bases. If you say, well, I want to be everywhere and it should be great everywhere, then probably we would go with React Native because usually the, the output at the native performance is the best. And what I've seen so far with Expo for the web is quite acceptable. Um, but then again, maybe web is more important for you. So we should start and build a great web application first and then go native. So this is really a trade-off. And I'm, I mean, I've tried and used all these technologies. And to be honest, I don't think there is a perfect solution that covers everything yet. Like something that has complete code sharing between web and native that looks great on the web, that just uses web technologies, but on a device is also super native. I think we're not yet there. Um, I mean, in theory, Capacitor could fill that gap, but we are always just running in a web view with Capacitor, so we will always be kind of limited. I think uh, that by definition, such an, an, a solution cannot exist almost by definition, I think. Because yeah, it would make the native platforms obsolete. Yeah, well, yeah, mm-hmm. first. And the second, and, and because they don't want to be obsolete, there's always going to be UI aspects or UX aspects to the native applications that are problematic to achieve on the web. I mean, you know, look at it from the, from this perspective. Like uh, the most successful category, I think, of native applications are mobile games. And how many mobile games do you know that run on the web? I think it's more or less zero. I mean, we did an episode about phaser and JavaScript games, but yeah, there aren't a lot. Most of them, in fact, it's funny. I was talking to Jason uh, Wyman, who he game dot courses, uh, and it'll come out as a bonus episode next week as we record this. I, I'm not sure the timing on the two, but you know, we were talking Unity, and a lot of the games are written in Unity and and pushed that way. So I don't know so, that mobile games is a use case that we're going to talk a lot about here. Yeah, that's that's actually an interesting point. Like we talk about wrappers and that we don't build native apps yet. So many developers, especially game developers, don't care about doing it with Swift or Android. They use Unity because they want to run everywhere. So we always mm-hmm. have this layer in between, uh, and I think it's it's not a problem. And 
In the past, we yeah. had Flash, by the way. They were also a mm-hmm. very successful category. Well, you could build games with Flash. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think you can export Unity to WebGL and run it on the web anyway. Oh, web, web GPU these days. But technically, you can. Practically, though, it's it's not happening. Sure. Now, I, I've to be honest, I've not tried to investigate in recent years why it's not happening. I can tell you that a couple of years back, I was working at a company that was doing a remote access solution in the web and getting it to work really well on mobile was really challenging around issues like even, you know, how do I get it to be full screen and not see the um, the bar at the top? Now, we can do these sort of things with a PWA, but there's always, there are like always sort of caveats around it. There's always limitations mm-hmm. that, that you run into. And like I said, the, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And realistically, you would think that companies would want to do uh, uh, their games on the uh, uh, their mobile games as web, if only to get away from the Apple tax, and yet they don't. Now I don't know. Maybe it's because people are used to looking for games in in the App Store and not on in you know, you know using Google Search. I don't know why why it is. But I'm, people also pay a lot faster inside native mobile applications. Also, like for sure, just just mm-hmm. paying two dollars, it's just two clicks and, and face ID, and I got my hundred gems per chase. Like it's so easy. Um, so yeah, I, I, I completely agree. The whole category of games, I wouldn't do games with with either of these technologies. Like it would probably work, and yes, you could use something like Phaser, but um, usually that category of games or Let's let's go crazy. If you want to develop Call of Duty Mobile, you probably wouldn't go to Capacitor or React Native or Flutter. You you would go uh, directly to Swift and and the Metal and uh, probably use mm-hmm. Unity, but nothing else. Yeah, you. I think you get a better experience if it's already on the phone, running on the phone, and more important than you know the thirty percent tax is: can I get people to keep playing my game? Because I think most of the games out there that are highly profitable are making money off of the in-app purchase. And so you have to keep them coming back. And and I just, I don't see, I mean, it could work on web, but I, I don't often see it. To be honest, when I'm looking at some of the games that I'm playing, and I'm not a big gamer on mobile or at all, but most of them, the graphics are not that amazing. It's so, it's not something that could not be implemented using something like Canvas on the web. I think it more has to do with the in-app purchases that are just mm-hmm. really problematic. I think it's also with the fact that people are used to looking for games in the app store rather than online. They just wouldn't know where mm-hmm. to find the game. They would go, you know, somebody would tell them that this great new game that I'm really liking and they would go to the app store. And if they don't find it there, then they just don't find it. Um, yeah. So, so Yeah. There is, by the way, also a big difference between iOS and Android users. So I've seen some statistics of like indie developers and um, they mostly now said that they only develop apps for iOS because 95% of their revenue is coming from iOS. Um, So I'm not an Android user, but it looks like Android users don't like to pay or are more used to free stuff. And um, iOS users are just, yeah, like, I don't know why. Maybe uh, it's iOS, the type of people who owns iPhones. Um, <laughs> iOS <laughs> users are richer. <laughs> I, I don't want to say that, that's, but it looks like that. I think that's true. I think iOS users are you're, they're more likely to be a, more affluent. But I I think that the more I think the bigger thing is that iOS users are more likely to pay. Period, because they're used to the ecosystem of paying. Back in the old days, you had to pay for OS X. I miss those days because back then every update was an update you were waiting to get your hands on, not <laughs> dreading coming and oh, ruining no, let, things. Let's not talk about iOS and updates. But but <laughs> but back in the back in the old days, you know, and and it's always been you pay for apps on your Mac. You know, you pay for iCloud and and Me dot com and all those things. Yet Apple has long fostered an ecosystem of paying and that yields i like it because it yields higher reliability i like paying three dollars for an app because it makes me think that when the next version of the app comes out 
it's still going to be there. All the free apps that I used to use back in college, they're, they're not in the app store anymore because the developers haven't, I mean, this is dumb on Apple's part that you can't run an app that was compiled 10 or 15 years ago. It won't run today. I don't know why that is. It's still arm. seems like it should, you still should still be able to download it and run it. But I guess it's Apple removes stuff out of their SDK. So they actually, they make breaking changes mm-hmm. and you have to recompile with the latest version of Xcode and those, and those apps aren't around. And, and, you know, so you can, that's Apple's fault, but, but and it happens on Android too. You have to recompile the Android apps every once in a while. Yeah. That's like one of the biggest advantages of the web. Uh, I mean, a website built for the original web back in 19, what was it? 87 still works fine today. I'm gonna I'm gonna fire up Web Space Invaders. I'm really looking forward to this. <laughs> it should except work. The blink tag, except the blink tag, right. and, ex- and except for Flash, but that's not really part of the web. Yeah, yeah. Dan's Ooh, got Hangman installed fired. on his phone. <laughs> Snake, <laughs> Snake. There you go. Anyway, um, but but getting back to kind of this crop cross platform app setup, then, um, you know. You talked about a lot of different options. You know, how do I decide, right? How do I decide which one to use? Because it, it sounds like some of it might come down to like, I want a more native feeling or less native feeling, or, you know, maybe I have more familiar, familiarity with React versus something else, right? And so I might pick a React native versus, you know, you know, hey, I have a React app that I can run on a capacitor with a little less work than the other. I mean, how how do you start making that decision? Because I could see companies saying, yeah, we want a mobile presence. We've got this web app, or maybe they don't even have that. You know, how, how do you start how do you start making that call? I mean, I mean, I mean, some companies know their customers and know that they wouldn't care if the app feels a bit more web like or looks a bit more web like. And in that case, I would always go with capacitor because you got like the the hundred percent code sharing. However, mm-hmm. um in, if you're talking about like developers specifically, so just, like just if you're to starting pause out you on in... that for a minute, just to make sure that I understand. So, capacitor, as you explained it, is this technology where effectively the uh, um, uh, native version is a web is a wrapped web view. So it's really my mm-hmm. code is pure web, but it's run, but it's like, a, or is is it like a zipped version of of my HTML mm-hmm. and JavaScript? Or is it even coming from the server in in that in that scenario, uh, just downloading to download it to a custom browser? What's what's the approach? So if you have like an Angular web app or a React web app, you would just install Capacitor with npm install Capacitor, and then you would have access to the Capacitor CLI in that project. Through the Capacitor CLI, you would then add like the iOS platform and the Android platform in that project, and that would add an iOS or an Android folder containing either an Android Studio project or an Xcode project. And Capacitor will, in that project, create all the like the storyboard files and whatever is required for a native project. And in that, at your web view, and whenever you run a build of your app, like npm run build or whatever, Capacitor would run or sync your dist folder into that native folder and put all your web files and minified JavaScript files into that native project. And if you then deploy that Xcode project or Android project to your device, you would just see like a native application. Because ultimately, this is a native application. Like, this is not a web application or a hybrid application. This is, in Apple's terms or in Android terms, a native application. And I can just go through Xcode and Android Studio and create an APK or a bundle and submit it to the stores. This is not like it has any relateness to web anymore at that point. And, I mean, and the people stores... like to discuss what is a native app and whatnot, but <laughs> it's a native app. So, okay. So I understand. So the JavaScript files, the HTML files, the CSS files are all bundled into that package that gets delivered yes. and installed on the client side. None of them are coming down in real time via HTTP from a web server. Yes, that is usually also forbidden uh, by Apple. You, you are not allowed to mm. just load your whole application from a remote server because of security issues. Like you could bundle everything. I understand. It. And Apple are okay with like the the app the Apple Store rules are fine with this type of an installation. Yes, because it's a native application built with Xcode. It is using a native control, the WK WebView control. 
um, and they're totally fine with this. And if I do want to use some sort of a custom local API in this type of a scenario or configuration, is this doable? What kind of API? I don't know. Some API that's available Bluetooth. to native, but not available to web. I don't know. Something with monetization. In, 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 yeah. In that case, you would add a capacitor plugin, which is pretty much like a Cordova plugin, a wrapper around native code. So a capacitor plugin consists of two or three folders having an iOS and an Android implementation and probably also a web implementation. And then you would just say, for example, the camera, you would install a capacitor camera. You would import the camera and you just call camera.getphoto. And that, that line would work. Uh, it doesn't matter on which platform you run. Like if you run this code on the web, it will also bring up a little web preview to capture an image. On Android, it will use the native camera. On iOS, it will also open the native camera because that is the magic, magic of Capacitor. They have this unified API, which usually for the plugins works everywhere. So you don't have if Android, if iOS, you just have this one line. And you're saying that the advantage of this approach is that it's the most cross, cross-platform. The disadvantage is that being cross-platform, the applications end up looking like web applications either, even when they run na- natively. To some degree, yes, that is, that is the short form. I mean, you can, can make your web applications look really native. Um, like that is most likely what Ionic is about. So we, we haven't really talked about Ionic. Ionic is... Uh, the company which also built Capacitor, by the way. Um, and Ionic is most likely just a UI kit. Like Ionic Framework gives you components like a navigation bar, tabs, um, native animations. So if you go to a details page, Ionic would handle this kind of routing. So it's not just replacing your view, but actually doing a push uh, transition on iOS or an Android, bringing it up from the bottom. They got models and overlays and that kind of stuff, because I completely agree. If you just take your React application, and yes, your React application on the web is responsive and it looks great on on small devices, but if you just throw it into a native container and run it as a native app, it it, it won't look and feel like a native application. Because like, if you do the routing, you just replace the, the pages, right? Users would immediately notice that this is not a native application. So... In those cases, you you would really need something like Ionic for for an improved native UI. So an Ionic is effectively like a library of components of, on top of Capacitor? It's not on top of Capacitor. It's actually not like there are separate packages. Oh. Um, I would think of Ionic uh, not, not like Tailwind or Bootstrap, but like a component library. What, what do they market themselves currently? Uh, I think they currently call themselves the mobile mobile UI toolkit. Um, so what you're looking yeah. for that, how would you then pick between Ionic and React Native? I- Ionic looks very native, but some people still criticize that it's not feeling native. So just yesterday I had a conversation with someone on Twitter, which was interesting. Um, he pointed out that, for example, if you have a card model, like on iOS, this is like when the background goes a bit back and the front stacks above it. You see it, I think, in the contact list or something when something slides up. And he brought up that the Ionic implementation doesn't feel native. And I, I, I thought like, no, it looks good. Uh, but then he made a little video where he was using the card with a finger. And you could clearly see that the card was dragging behind. Like his finger was down while the card was still like, 150 pixels above it. Now, if you check out the native iOS application, the contact or something, and you try that same, you're going to notice it completely snaps to your finger. These are just small things. He noticed it. Some people might notice it. I actually didn't notice it immediately. So Ionic does a pretty good job in disguising that you are using a web application. And Chuck, I think you can agree you've built a few Ionic apps. They usually like... To, to your aunt, they will usually look like a super native yeah. application. Yep. That, that's been so, my experience. And and I'm not so picky that I would have even noticed it. Like, uh, yeah. I haven't gone in and, like, directly tried to compare them. But I didn't feel like it was that it felt different from yeah. the, the regular native app. And so so these, like, super small and tiny things 
this will probably work better with Flutter and React Native. I, I haven't made a total comparison. Um, I will definitely yeah. do it on exactly this thing. Um, but I guess this is what people point out if they say, hey, this this looks like a web application. But again, with Ionic, if you just look at the application in general, it, it just looks totally native. Like you have native buttons, sliders, toggles, alerts, inputs, whatever. Um, and the cool thing about Ionic, by the way, is that if you use, for example, an input field with Ionic, you would get on iOS an input field that looks like iOS, but on Android, you would get one that looks like Android because they have this adaptive styling. They have components and uh, in the background, they basically have two separate CSS files. So if your app runs on iOS, they would attach to the body the class iOS. And if your app runs on Android, they attach wait the minute. class so, MD. So wait a minute, just to, to clarify that I understand. So with Ionic, the components look native, but they're actually web? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, so that's the, their web components. Yeah, so that's the HTML, big difference CSS. between, I guess, I guess, between Ionic and React Native, where with right. React Native, the components themselves would be native components, mm -hmm. which means that you probably want to have a native developer on hand to deal with issues having to do with the native components. So yes, I'm looking at the Ionic page right now, and my heart has just grown three times bigger because they are the only framework that I've ever seen where if you drag a slider, it works. In <laughs> iOS native, you cannot drag a slider. You have to tap it in order for it to go to the other side. In Angular, it literally, in the Angular's Material UI demo page, to this day, right now, if you go to that page, it has the it has a little slider image, and if you and it says, slide me. That's literally the text on top of it, slide me and you cannot slide it, you have to click on it. Ionic is the first time I've ever seen the slider implemented that if I click and drag it over, it works. So I am, I am through the roof right now, believing that if they've paid attention to detail in a way that they've beat out Apple at their own game, this really might be seriously looking into uh, worth seriously looking into because they are paying attention to the fine details. Maybe they're off by that. You know, they don't have native responsiveness, which is a grievous sin. But I would say that in this case, having the slider actually work when you slide it makes up for that. I just have to say that I'm pretty gratified that AJ made a Grinch reference to himself. <laughs> Yeah, and and just to you know, add a little bit to this um, conversation. Yeah, so both Flutter and React Native, the UI is native UI, and then it connects across a JavaScript bridge that lets you run your um, your business logic and stuff in JavaScript. So that's that's the difference: is your components are not web at that point; they're native components. Yeah. So yeah. Ionic is 100% web. And and just to clarify, because people like, it's hard to separate. Ionic is the company. They do mm -hmm. have Ionic framework, which is this set of UI components. They also develop Capacitor because they saw problems with Cordova and the approach Cordova took. So they built Capacitor, but Capacitor is not related to Ionic. Like you can use Capacitor with jQuery or something like it doesn't really mm -hmm. matter. And on top of that, Ionic also built Stencil, uh, which is a tool to build web components because all the Ionic components, like items, cards, and whatever, these things are also now web components, which enabled Ionic some versions ago to open up to other uh, frameworks like React. So until, I think, Ionic 3, you could only use Ionic with Angular. And that's also the reason why... A lot of Angular people know about Ionic, and Ionic is used by like, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think it's still 70% Angular. Um, but since they switched to web components, you can basically import Ionic components uh, wherever you want, and then you benefit from the adaptive CSS, which means native iOS or native Android styling. I have a question about cross-platform because we keep talking iOS and Android. Um, for a while there, people kept trying to push like, the Microsoft phone OS into the conversation, but that's kind of just not a thing anymore. Um, 
But one thing that people use, for example, um, Apple's tvOS is effectively iOS with modifications, right? Um, you've got the Amazon Fire Stick, which is Android with modifications. You've got some of these other systems. You know, maybe I want to make a an app that will run on my mobile device or on my desktop. So how far does cross-platform go, right? You know, can I run it on a video game console? I, I honestly don't know. I, I think it runs everywhere the web is, but I haven't built anything for Apple TV. After after this conversation, I will definitely add this to my list of to try things uh, because this will definitely be interesting. So one thing I know is that you can uh, also have something uh, that targets your watch with Ionic, mm -hmm. but basically this is... Um, like you're not getting code sharing for that kind of project. You would have to add that natively to your Xcode project. Like you have a watch clip in Xcode that you can do because Capacitor mm -hmm. works that way. Uh, but this is not really related to cross-platform then anymore. Yeah, I'm um, pretty sure however, that React Native does tvOS. Yeah, do they? Then I would hope Ionic does as well. I just I just quickly looked this up and there is a, a post from 2019 on the Ionic forum. Does Ionic framework support Apple TV and Android TV? No answer. <laughs> so that, that, that's not really giving me any hope all, on that topic. All I can tell you is that my children, my kids, they watch Netflix and whatnot on their phones, not on TV. True, true. Weirdos. Um, <laughs> all that 4K gone to waste. <laughs> but um, you can definitely my get the Electron too, platform if you want to. So with Electron platform, uh, you could at least build... Uh, Linux or Windows or Mac app uh, from your web app code. I've done that before, um, and that part works actually pretty great. Like uh, people are kind of surprised. Um, yeah, and, you know, you know uh, Visual Studio Code is Electron, and tons of applications we're using uh, are using Electron. So um, that's definitely possible. However, I really uh, so if we, if the listener of the podcast is curious, I would also recommend to check out something like Tori. Uh, which is getting a lot of fame. Um, I think Dan is now killing me internally because I'm bringing up one of another hype JavaScript. No, it's actually not JavaScript. It's it's Rust, um, which and brings another thing to this conversation, Rust. <laughs> and it's not hype. It's a practical solution for a real problem of I don't want to have a 500 megabyte installer for a web view. That's yeah. a yeah, real yeah. problem. <laughs> have, you, have you tried it? I don't know. I'm really, I, I, so we, there is an app that we are working on at Dash Incubator. At Dash Incubator, there is an app that we are tentatively planning to use Tori for. I don't know whether or not any of the apps that I've installed natively are using Tori or not. I know that, well, I know the ones that aren't because they take forever to load. I don't know if any of them are. So there is that. That disclaimer, but in terms of what it is supposed to do, that basically everything's baked in, so you don't you don't have to do a custom compile for the normal stuff. The normal stuff is there. You can literally just take your JavaScript project and then basically have it bundled in a zip file in the binary, so that the binary accesses the zip file as virtual media, essentially, and opens the web view from from that. But you get access to things like local storage and whatever. You don't have to install Rust and compile Rust or write Rust plugins to be able to do the basic stuff with it. If you need to do something really, you know, really, really native, then, yeah, you have to dip into Rust. But for the basic stuff, you don't. And so that, and and it's supposed to be kilobytes. So I guess I have to backpedal because I, I, don't, I don't know if I've been using anything with it. But it it solves a problem that I have. I wish that Slack and Discord and the other 10 Electron apps that I have would use that instead. Yeah, that's certainly a problem of Electron, I agree. Um, I haven't tried Tori yet, but uh, it looks promising. And I think I saw a solution where somebody used... I think a Next.js application and somehow created like a binary from that Next.js application and put that into your Tori application with Rust. So you can also get like the Next.js API endpoints in that Tori application working. It looked kind of crazy, but 
at the same time, it was actually pretty cool. So if that is a solution. I, I'm not, a, I have to say that I'm not such a big fan of the, of such a solution. I think the primary motivation for modern meta frameworks is kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, synchronizing the backend and the front end in, in modern web applications, like creating, you know, what the, the full stack experience. And that's kind of not how you build native apps. Uh, native apps are, are fully local. Um, so this whole, you know, like React is with server components are moving to be like backend first. That's like totally foreign to your approach when you're building a native application. So I don't know how these kind of work well together. If anything, I expect to see maybe an evolution of, of native specific meta frameworks, if that kind of makes sense. I don't know. Time will tell. I haven't seen anything in that space yet come up over the last time, but it would be interesting to see. Yeah. Um, I use tons of the the modern frameworks like Astro and uh, everything that's cool right now. But ultimately, yeah, I agreed that, that native in the past, when the company where I work with, we usually said the native application is dumb and doesn't do a lot. Like it's just displaying your JSON data in, in some way. Um, I mean, there are tons of other applications which do more things, but I agree that we probably shouldn't do everything that's possible. And I think this case where somebody bundled this as a binary with Tori was more like experimenting and playing around with what's possible. Um, but so like I'm, in this meme, we, we should probably stop and think about if what's possible is actually a good idea. Oh, absolutely. We need to do picks soon. What what was the complaint about this? Or I I, I missed something because I was just thinking that they did the normal thing you're supposed to do, create an app and then bundle it with Tori. But it sounds what why was this? What what was the contention or the conflict about what they did? Because I missed that. I think Dan brought up some objection about it. Yeah, my point was that uh, Simon mentioned that they were using it to take a Next.js application and transform it into a native application. And I said that Next.js is inappropriate for uh, for native applications because the whole point of, of something like a Next.js is to build a full stack type of an application. And that's not what you're aiming to do when you're building native applications. Uh. Okay, so you're saying because it runs the the back end with the database or something like that. I'm saying that if you're you you're if you're looking at a native application, your back end is probably going to be, I don't know, Node with Express or maybe right. just or maybe just talk directly to the microservices that are implemented in Go or whatever because you know, what's the point of having React on the back end? when you're doing a native application. Okay, yeah, I, I, I get that. It would not make sense. It seems like an abuse of the Tori use case to bundle Node with it for server-side stuff. But I, I, I could see just having a light API and then have that API connect out to the file storage, the, the system uh, keychain, the, you know, that, that sort of stuff. So yeah, so Node with Express, you know, you don't no, need no, no, anything no, more Node. than that. Not Node. No, I mean Tori, using Tori. Ah, okay. So just uh, like having having some sort of routing layer to glue between the API call to Tori rather than having the API call directly. Having one layer of separation that's more similar to what you would do in a client server application. Because then if you needed to do it on the web and local, you still have that layer of separation there. It doesn't have to be Express on the back end. It could just be connecting to Tori, but have a layer such that it uh, gives you the same isolation and you can copy and paste and say, okay, our web version uses our database that you log into, but the local version uses the, the Tori file store. As some kind of caching and yeah. Yeah, I would probably, what I would probably do is I would have 
like make sure that I can use the same set of microservices implemented as whatever for both my next, let's say, Next.js uh, application and the native. And the native just have a, a very thin layer of a Node.js talking to those uh, web app to those microservices doing whatever aggregation I need and ex and 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 exposing the data via RESTful API or something like that. I, I don't see the need for anything more substantial than that if you're talking about a native application. All right, I'm going to push us to picks. We're kind of getting to that point. Um, but yeah, I think you're both, you know, you're making points. So anyway, um, and I don't know if I follow all of it either, but let's let's go ahead and do picks. I'm <laughs> just being honest. Um, now we you, we've been doing the um, kind of the self promo thing, but I'm I'm not sure it's really getting people what they want. So um, if you have a self promo, <laughs> like the listener, I mean. So if you have a self promo, just keep it to thirty seconds and put it in as one of your picks. I definitely have one. But uh, AJ, what are your picks? Okay, so I am going to pick. Volume Master and Video Speed, which I think I picked these before. These are Chrome plugins. Volume Master allows you to manage volume, particularly to boost volume. So for me, for whatever reason, Simon was really, really low. And so I was able to boost my volume to 300%, which I have no idea what that means. I wish they would use DB because that's a scale that actually is coherent. But whatever 300% means, I boosted it to 300%. And then I'm able to hear, and I have to do this YouTube videos all the time where the YouTube video was recorded with really low volume. And so volume master is just really awesome. And then it'll show you which tab. Does it go to 11 AJ? Uh, unfortunately, no, unfortunately, no, but I did contact him to ask him to use DB instead. And he said, normal people don't understand DB to which I responded. Yeah. Well, normal people don't understand percent either because percents don't mean anything in volume. <laughs> They have, By the they way, do you know? Do you get anything. my reference of going to eleven? Yes. Ah, yes. I, I just wanted. I I needed to make sure. Yes. 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 I I did. But with you can take it to eleven with DB. You can put it at a. <laughs> you can you can put it to twelve DB. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, and then the the video speed allows you to do video speed, so you can just. Uh, I think it's DNS are the keyboard shortcuts and it will speed up the video by 0.1 or decrement the video speed by 0.1. So if you, you know, if you've got a voice you're really familiar with and you're listening to a podcast on YouTube, you can put it on three X or four X or whatever it is that you personally can handle, but it lets you get higher than YouTube's default too, which I often find with voices that I'm familiar with and they're familiar with their accent. I can handle a 2.5. Okay. And sometimes even three. And so I like the video speed. And then also I'm going to go ahead and pick Speechify. There's a lot of things that I still have gripes about Speechify, but I am finding more and more uses for it. And having their browser plugin scares me a little bit because I don't know if they're actually a security focused company and their browser plugin has access to my email and things like that. But I can just click play in an email and their voices do a pretty decent job. And it, it works on uh the the web the web version seems to work pretty well the ios version is kind of meh but it it uses ai voices and they don't sound anywhere near as bad as things used to in the past so those are kind of uh my picks and i'll throw in aw the awesome tori repo i'm actually looking through this to see what kind of things i want to use i'm looking at off me as one of them potentially but i yeah i'm very interested to see what what things that I'm using now that I could be using Tori with instead. And then as far as self-promo goes, uh, Beyond Code Workshops, if you're interested in in that, reach out to me at underscore Beyond Code on Twitter, or you can hit up my inbox. You can find my email. And then BNNA. So I, I've been talking about the hosting service. We've called it BNNA now. Uh, the landing page is at bnna.net. Right now, it's just a sign-up form, but I imagine by the time you hear this, in two to three weeks, we will have our first, uh, we'll be open to to beta customers and have our payment portal up as well. So if you want privately owned cloud hosting that is cheaper by the bunch, that's BNNA. Awesome. Dan, what are your picks? 
Okay, so first I will start with a little bit of self-promo. I think I did it in a previous episode, but I'll do it again. I'm starting a kind of a conference round for the next two and a half months. So uh, I'll be speaking at IJS London on April the 27th. Then I'll be speaking at uh, JS Nation, uh, the online version on, uh, what is it, uh, um, yeah. It's May June, 31st yeah, no, through June. Yeah, so I'll be speaking yeah. on June 5th, yeah. And then okay. I'll be speaking at J Nation, yeah, it's a different conference, in Portugal, uh, in Coimbra on um, May 6th. And then I'll be uh, at React Next in Tel Aviv in Israel on June 27th. So, so yeah, those are a lot of conferences, and hopefully... You know, if you're listening to this podcast, you'll be able to attend at least one. And if you are, then please do, you know, uh, come and say hi, because I really like to get uh, up and close with our listeners. Um, so that's my bit of self-promo. And then with regard to picks, it's not so much of a pick as an observation. Um, I have to say that to judge by my wife, Google are in deep, deep trouble. My wife has stopped using Google for searches completely. She's, search she's looking for everything using chat GPT. Uh, for example, we're currently <laughs> planning our trips around the conferences. One of the great things about conferences is that uh, ab either before or after, we usually do a bit of vacationing. So that's true for a visit uh, in, in, uh, for IJS after London. We'll be heading to France. And it's also true for J Nation Portugal, where we'll be touring Portugal. And she's helping me build our trip. And she's not Googling at all. She's just using GPT, ch uh, chat GPT to ask it where to go and what to see and what to visit and, you know, what's good and what's bad and what, because the the information it provides is so much more accessible than Google. First of all, with Google, you got this whole bunch of promoted shit that, you know, has nothing to do with whatever you're searching for. And then you've got sites that are unclear which one is better and which one is worse. And a lot of them are just promoting stuff. And she's with ChatGPT, she's just getting the answer that she's looking for. Um, so, so yeah, if I were, was, if I were Google, I would be quaking in my boots and it's getting to the point where I'm thinking that if you're holding Google stock, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, let me, let me ask though, cause my main problem with chat GPT is anything that's well known, which I imagine vacation locations and what to see are things that well are super well known. Most of the articles on the web were probably written by GPT over the last <laughs> 10 years that it's been around, right? So it probably knows a lot better how to filter it out to not the crap because it wrote most of those articles, I would imagine. But what about that? My problem with chat GPT is when it sounds right and it's 100% wrong. Yeah, it's even worse when it sounds right, but it's... I don't know, 80% uh, right and 20% wrong, and you don't know which 20%. Right. So I actually, I actually spoke about this, uh, on like either pre the previous episode or the one before that. Anthony Campalo actually suggested to me to ask ChatGPT about myself. Uh, and uh, since there's information, since I have presence before 2021, uh, ChatGPT has information about me. And it provides, so I basically asked it something like, what is Dan Shapir known for? And it, you know, it gave a very flattering response. I really enjoyed what it said. But unfortunately, about 20% of the answer was totally wrong. It kind of provided my CV and it said that I worked at uh, Google. I've never worked at Google. It said that I worked at Akamai. I've never worked at Akamai. Uh, I it, it did mention that I worked at Wix, which is correct, and that I think it said also mentioned. Actually, it didn't mention that I currently work at Next because that's too new. But you know, bringing up two companies that I've never worked at, but might have worked at, or you know, you could reasonably assume that I 
have worked at, that's problematic. Um, and that kind of highlights the, the, the risk or the challenge with it. But on the other hand, so much of the information that you find via using Google is also wrong. So, yes, but that's kind of, I, again, I would point to the information that's wrong on Google is the sites that were completely generated by AI in the first place, <laughs> right? And so you yeah. have to sift out to this. But once you find a site that's written by humans, which is hard, and normally they're not as pretty, those sites have correct information. But most what? sites on the internet are chat GPT, analyze it, because people don't realize chat GPT has been around for what, 15 years now? How long is, I mean, it's, it's been around a long time and we're only now hearing about it. But most articles on Forbes, most articles on ESPN, every top 10 site, all of that stuff has been written predominantly by chat GPT with a human doing some curation to say, oh, that's a bad paragraph. Don't put that. Well, I have to say that what kind of surprises, surprises me, though, is that they don't use some well-known resources for validation of the answers. Uh, it doesn't seem like that would be you know, tech technologically too difficult to do. Like if you're asking somebody, like uh, uh, you're asking about somebody specifically, like in my case, asking about myself, I mean, using LinkedIn to verify that I actually worked at the places where it said I've, I've worked doesn't seem like to be too much of a technical challenge uh, or or validating historical facts with, I don't know, Wikipedia or something like that. So. I, I don't know. It seems that they could, you know, automatically do more validation than they're currently doing. But, you know, this v is not Validating my area. against Wikipedia. It's better than nothing. Uh, That's true. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah. I'm going to close the tangent. But yeah, I think I think you both make good points. Because, um, yeah, a lot of times it's got great info. But uh, the other thing that I've seen, I was talking to somebody who was doing... Uh, C sharp development and basically asked it to write it, write them C sharp code. And he was like, it's, it's decent code. But then he tried to get it to write embedded code and there just wasn't enough training data on it. And so it, it, it just fumbled on it. So I think it really yeah. just depends on what it what's been trained on. Um, anyway, Dan, did you have other picks? Well, just the usual stuff of support the people of Israel in their fight for democracy and support their, the people of Ukraine in their fight to survive. And those are my picks for today. All right. I'm going to throw in some picks then. Um, my self-promo, I've got so many things going on. I'm just going to do the one that's kind of the most uh, timely. And that is, uh, I did an interview, as I said earlier, with uh, Jason Wyman on how to build video games. Um, we've talked our, our way around how you know, these options aren't great for that, but um, he has a course on how to do Unity to build um, mobile and desktop games. Um, I think you can also do console games and other things with it as well. We also talked about building business apps with Unity. And uh, anyway, I'm going to be going through his course. I think I've mentioned that before. Um, basically, the week after next, starting on Thursdays at 9 a.m. Mountain Time, that's 8 a.m. Pacific time and 11 a.m. Eastern time. Um, I tried to pick a time that would work for people in Europe as well. Um, I'm going to be going through the course and then whoever shows up on those calls, which will be totally open and free, right? I'm not going to charge for it. You don't have to have a membership for it. Um, I just want people to go through the process with me. Um, and so you can go get his course. Um, I'll put a link in the show notes to it. It's on game.courses if you can find it there. Uh, he gave me a coupon code for 20% off. That's JavaScript 5. Um, he's also going to be putting up a bundle. So uh, Dan talked about conferences, and I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, he, they're doing an online summit uh, for game developers, and then they're also going to have a gather.town where you can kind of walk through the virtual expo area and chat with folks, and I'll be there. Um, and that's the gamedevguild.com and the same coupon code. Uh, JavaScript 5 will get you 20% off the ticket to that. Um, and they've got like thousands of dollars worth of freebies that Unity and other companies have basically donated. So um, anyway, it's a really cool deal. And uh, yeah, looking forward to getting into some game dev with Unity. So uh, 
I, I guess it's a promo, but it's a promo mostly because I want people to talk to about game dev. Um, and then conferences, I'm going to be at JS Nation. I'm actually going to be at JS Nation, and they're doing the React Summit right before, right afterward. I can't remember. Lucky but I'll be bastard. at that too. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I will be in Amsterdam for for the conference. So Amsterdam's if you're going to be city. there, let me know. Yeah, I've been there once, and I... I only had a day to kind of visit stuff, so I'm really looking forward to seeing highly, them. highly recommended see. place, highly recommended place to visit. I think uh, Simon yeah. would agree with me. Yeah, not too, not too far away from us. Yeah, you'll have to come up and visit. All right. Um, so, as far as board games go, um, what game do I want to pick today? I didn't actually prep, and I should have. Um, I'm going to pick kind of a hybrid video game slash you can get cards and play it um i don't know if you guys have all ever played star realms um but yeah it started out i think actually as a um a de- it's a deck building game right so you um you pick the cards that go into your hand and then you can play it um i played the digital version in fact i think i've only played the digital version i have friends that own the physical cards and so you can uh buy it um Let's see. Board Game Geek has it a 1.93. And it's, you know, so it's a relatively simple game to pick up. You know, uh, anybody can play it. Um, and yeah, a round takes like 20 minutes. You know, I've had rounds go faster. I've had rounds go slower. Um, when you're playing on the phone, you can either play against other people or play against the computer. Um, and sometimes the computer is hard and sometimes the computer is not hard to beat. So anyway, I'm going to pick Star Realms because that's that's definitely a fun one, and that's one that you can carry in your pocket, right? Um, as far as other things go, um, I think I'm going to take a page out of Dan's book a little bit. I'm not going to get too specific, but um, at least here in the U.S., things are starting to warm up as far as like people running for office and stuff like that. We're going to be seeing that a whole lot more next year. But... I just want to encourage people, if there are things that are important to you, go find out what those issues are. Go find out what's being ha- happening in your state legislatures because um, a lot of things are moving there <laughs> right now. Um, pay attention to who's running for governor uh, in your state. What what I'm seeing is that a lot of these battles are starting to be fought in the, in the states instead of in the federal government here in the U.S. Um, I know that that's probably different depending on what country you're in you know, in, in other things, right? Dan's been pretty involved in the political situation over in Israel. But, um, you know, you, you you have to stay on top of this stuff, know what's going on, know what the implications are. And then the other piece of that is, is that a lot of times we hear, <laughs> <coughs> there I go, I cough. All right. So um, the other thing that I see, though, is that a lot of times we see kind of hyperbolic rhetoric about one side or the other, you know, they're trying to you know, completely destroy the country. And the other side is also trying to completely destroy the country. And I would encourage you to go talk to people who are on the other side of whatever issue that you're concerned about. Because what I find is that a lot of times we can kind of agree on some things, right? We we, we kind of want certain levels of stability in our lives or certain, you know, um, common principles about how the government runs, even if we disagree on how to get there. And just being able to see and understand other people's point of view, it really goes a long way. And I'm I'm not picking any issue one way or the other, but that's something that I've kind of learned. And I don't know that it's necessarily deeply changed the way that I see some of these issues, but it does humanize the people on the other side so that they're not just terrible, evil people. I would also add that uh, after 250 years, one politician is unlikely to destroy the U.S. Fair. Anyway, so those are my picks. I'm just going to encourage people, you know, be kind, be curious, and uh, yeah, go get involved. Uh, Simon, what are your picks? Uh, Shameless promo is galaxies.dev, which is my latest platform for all web uh, development-focused courses. We got courses from myself, and I got some guest creators creating uh, pro courses, so... 
Check it out at galaxies.dev. I looked through it. It looks really good. I, I <laughs> checked some of the promo content there, it, and I really and I liked it a lot. So I definitely encourage our listeners to go and check it out. Thanks. Yeah, a lot, a lot more is planned. I currently also work on an updated view for uh, some courses and having this improved. Um, just go through it. You can actually join for free and check out the community and stuff, and then uh, upgrade to pro if you want to get the pro courses. Um, Besides that, my, my picks are kind of short, but I'm currently diving into everything AI because I think this is like the most important thing right now we should follow. AI is probably not where it should be yet. It is probably not replacing developers in two years, but um, just last or two weeks ago, I basically created a whole app using AI. So I started creating UI screens with Midjourney uh, if you don't know, check it out, midjourney.com. Mm -hmm. You can you just need to join a Discord. So all of this feels a bit like Web3, um, but it's pretty, pretty amazing. Like I generated app UIs that looked really, really good. I use ChatGPT all the time to help me with React Native coding questions and scaffold screens. Um, my whole in-app purchase flow was basically done with ChatGPT because I didn't know how it works. I created app icons uh, with Midjourney. I used ChatGPT to create the App Store description. Like, I used Copilot while coding. Like, this whole AI driven development, it just works and it just made me a lot faster. And the app, you can check it out. It's called Unique Bedtime Stories. It's only available on the iOS App Store. Uh, it's an app where you can just put in a few things about your children, like age, name, and characters they like. And then with the OpenAI API generates a little story like how Elsa in Arendelle is playing around with Harry Potter and something crazy. So you're um, using nice. AI to build AI applications. There's Yes, exactly. There's, there's, it's the, there's it's the AI like, section. <laughs> it's kind of meta. There's, you know, something yeah. to consider. Yeah, I, I just highly check, uh, re recommend both this and also just being curious about the AI tools, like what's going on, what is Pinecone, what are vector embeddings. And uh, if you can jump onto this and just have a bit of understanding about what's going on right now, I think um, you're in a pretty good spot over the next month or years to uh, like build and ship cool products. So no, it's not enough I that I have JavaScript FOMO. Now I also have AI FOMO. You know what? I felt pretty good about AI and following some stuff. And then two two days ago evening, I, I read a Reddit thread about everything that happened in AI in that week. And I opened that thread and I just scrolled with my thumb on the screen. And I had like five times scrolling until I came to the end of the list. And at that point, I was like, it is impossible to follow everything that happens in just one week. So... Uh, <laughs> Just just do your best. I don't know. Subscribe to like two newsletters which keep you posted about AI once a week. And uh, it's it's I, you could probably spend your whole day, the rest of the next I don't know two years, just looking at AI news and what's coming out, which new model and which diagram and how things work. And then you get the uh, what's it called? Artificial general intelligence, baby AGI. I use all of that. It's it's crazy. It's mind blowing. Um, just be curious and don't say this is the next Web3 because I don't think this is the next Web3. Uh, this has already helped me a lot more than Web3 So <laughs> with the building this app. So everything AI related is really something. Yeah. Uh, un unlike Web3, Web3 won't take uh, control of the world in like a couple of years and turn us into their, its slaves. So yeah. Yeah. And Web3 won't replace developers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... That's my, my plug. And I think we know a lost Chuck. Okay. In that case, uh, I think I'll, I'll wrap us up. Uh, another great episode. Just before we conclude, if people want to find you uh, and contact you, what, what's the best way to do so? You can find me on Twitter. Just search for Simon Grimm. My name was picked, I don't know, 15 years ago. So it's Schlimson, uh, S-C-H-L-I-M-M-S-O-N. Uh, but you can also search for Simon Grimm. I also now have this blue check mark. Um, yeah, Ooh, fancy. I don't know if it helps. Yeah, I don't know if it helps, but I'm I'm happy to pay Elon the $5. Yeah, All he right. needs the money. <laughs> <laughs> it's going down anyway. Yeah, Twitter's values dropped a ton. Anyway, uh, thanks for coming, Simon. This was a ton of fun. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, folks. We're going to wrap it up here. Till next time, Max out.